Okay, next one. Keith Hunter Jesperson, a.k.a. the Happy Face Killer. Yeah. Good old Keithy. How did he earn that name? Well, Keith was an interstate trucker. Again, a big guy, six foot seven, built like one of his trucks. Born in Canada, settled in Seattle area. Would go out on his rig, driving all around the States, picking up girls, uh, prostitutes at truck stops, and then raping them and killing them. I think he killed seven. He is quite interesting in many ways, but his probably the most horrible kill he did was a girl. I think her name was Sabrese. He tied tied her body under the back axle of his truck, his rig, when she was alive or half alive, and dragged her about twelve miles, I think, across the snow army pass in the rain and the snow, Ooh. until all that was left was fragments of bone Ooh. and skin. But this is a fascinating bit about this thing. This was the girl whose body or part of her body caught his arrest although there was nothing ever left some road cleaners were going along picking up trash and they found what the part of a what they thought was a roadkill of a deer or something a bit of meat but it was a human part of a human thigh and they they called their inspector just to check it and he said that looks like a human part of a human so they took it to the doctors, a surgeon or somebody, and in the bone was a small stainless steel pin, pin, no no bigger than a small matchstick, smaller than a matchstick, really. And under the microscope, it had a number. And she'd had a, a bone injury, and she'd had it pinned. And they traced that number back to her, back to Keith. Wow. And that's how he got caught. But while he was on the run... He was sending torting letters to the police, catch me if you can type letters, like Bill Hirons did and a few others. And he'd always put a, a smiley and a happy face. <sighs> but when I tell him, when I when I was right, I mean, I had thousands of letters from him. But when I what I did in a couple of letters, I put a smiley and he said, don't insult me with a smiley. I think that's rude. But he ha again has scores of murder groupies writing to him. And he sent me a thick file of love letters because he likes to boast with photographs of the girls have, he, that have written to him. And one of them, he said, this girl, look at this girl's letter. And it had a red lipstick mark on it. And I just, oh, it's a lipstick, you know, a kiss. And then when I wrote back to him, said, who was the girl that kissed the letter? I said, I don't know who it was. It's an American girl. He said, oh, no, that's not lipstick. That's menstrual blood. Wow. No, a sick, sick man. What caused him to become a sick man? We're all born as little babies, and then what happens? How do they people? Well, he again, he had a great home. Uh, his father was an outdoor man, fisherman. I mean, wanted to bring his health up. Probably a bit strict, but that's no excuse for what he did. Religious. He, he just became a, a, a sick pervert, and that was it. There was nothing in his childhood to suggest he'd been abused or anything like that. There was no no signs of abuse. <coughs> so then, so he was just driving over around the country, then random victims here and there. Yeah, just pick up hitchhikers or something. Well, they were prostitutes at drugs, uh, or, or or hitchhikers. Prostitutes at trucks. I mean, you get a lot of that uh, with um, truckers, and you get it with taxi drivers sometimes, and you get it with delivery drivers and people out when they're driving along on their own a lot. They start to fantasize, especially if they've got some inner fantasy. Um, and a woman climbing a lift, or even a woman who's drunk, like a lot of Peter Sutcliffe's victims were when they came out of their clubs, make for easy pickings. Have you studied Sutcliffe much? Yes. What's your thoughts on him? It's, I think it's always been posed that he was a sex killer in the true sense. I disagree. He never once killed 
for sexual gratification. Not like a lot of other serial killers. He killed because he hated women with a passion. Because most of them were prostitutes, or I prefer to say working girls, a bit more PC, he had a hatred for his mother because she cheated on his father, and that shocked him. He found out that Sonia, when they were engaged, had had an affair. That was his wife. Yeah, later his wife. Uh, it, a little man syndrome almost with him. And he built up this hatred. He, he was an insignificant little grave digger, but he was he had a big, he, he was narcissistic, narcissistic, and he would groom himself for hours, standing in front of a mirror, trying to make himself look bigger and smarter than what he was. But women generally weren't, weren't very interested in him. Only Sonia was the only one that really took any interest in him. And he developed this hatred for women. And of course, if you hate, if you get into that pathology, then you start thinking, what are the easiest prey? And then it's prostitutes. And they're dirt. to him, they were dirt. And if you look at the kill itself, there was never any sexual assault as such, not rape or anything like that. It was overkill. It was bashing the head in. And when a ki serial killer like, for instance, Harvey Carrington, who I interviewed, Harvey the Hammer in, in Minnesota, when you see a destruction of the head or terrible stabbings, there's hatred more than anything. Do you see what Just I mean? A it's an overkill, a frenzy. Keith Hunter Jesperson told me in MCF, um, I said, why did you smash their skulls to a pulp? He said, because they played mind games with me and I was destroying the mind. But can you see it now? Can you see that mind set thinking? Yeah. Hate women, the brain, the mind playing mind games, teasing him. Same with Sutcliffe. It, it's not rocket science when you actually look look at it carefully. Do you know anything about Sutcliffe's relationship with Jimmy Savile? That's not in my remit, really. The person to ask would be, um, a colleague here, Boris, and uh, I, I really don't know that. There's a lot of people that Boris knows with his website that would probably know more than I do. I've heard something, but I don't really want to comment on that. So you visited Harry the Hammer. Harvey the Hammer. Harvey yeah. the Hammer. Yeah, Harvey Lewis Carey. What, what did he look like? Ooh, another big guy. Uh, built like an, a, a gorilla. Even at the age he was, 60 or something, when I met him, he could still do one-arm pull-ups for quite a long time. Um, almost a near all type head, ugly as sin. Very soft voice. Almost a grandfatherly voice when you're talking to him. Um, comforting voice. But he killed probably 50. 50? About that, yeah. I mean, he, he's been convicted of quite a few, but I, I'm not sure how many he's been convicted of, but not anything like that. But they found, when they arrested him, they found a map in his car uh, all around the United States, and there were red crosses in certain places, and every time they went to a red cross, they found a body. They reckon it's about 50. How did he get away with it for so long? A bit like Bundy. He, 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 he moved into state. You know, he shifted around. He went from one jurisdiction to another. But his arrest was interesting because I met the two arresting officers um, and uh, they told me that they that one of the victims, some of his victims, he let go. He, he, he actually patched up their wounds and took them home. <laughs> Is that because they managed to talk him around? Uh, you know, I don't, you don't know. He, something happened in his mind, but... <coughs> Excuse me, please. But they had a description of his car, which was a, a, a pea green, a black over pea green Chevy or something. And, and the police were in downtown Minneapolis and they spotted this car parked outside a diner early in the morning. And so they, in those days, they didn't actually have radios, they had to go to a telephone box or something. So one officer went round back and uh, one, no, one officer sort of sat in the car, the other one went and looked in the diner and the diner said, oh, yeah, the big guy in that car, he's just hightailed it out back. But he walked back to the, walked back to get in his own car and he got arrested. Mm. I, uh, Russell Kruger, the chief detective, was Irish cop. I, I spoke to him uh, and you get Irish Minnesota cops said hard. You know, this, isn't, this is a real tough guy. 
And he said to me, Harvey the Hammer, he said, he said they should have fried the fucker. He said they should have fried him. He said there'd have been a queue waiting to pull the switch. He said then they should have buried him. No, stuck a stake through his heart, buried him, dig him up a week later and stick another stake in to make sure he was effing dead. He's a, mon he's a monster. Wow. But when you actually talk to him, despite his ugly looks, and again, you can find his picture on the M uh, Minnesota Inmates website, he looks like an ape, a gorilla, but he's got such a soft voice. You know, you wouldn't think... Early, you and he was unshackled as well. Yeah. Early, you mentioned Henry Lee Lucas. What do you think about all the um, unsolved crimes they pinned on him? Yeah, Henry. Yeah, <laughs> good old Henry boy. Yeah. Um, again, part of all my travels, really. Um, I met Henry in um, on death row at uh, Ellis Unit. One eye, gungy, wiping his gun, and he he said to me, "We're a television crew there." And he said, "Chris, he said, I I done killed nobody." You see, okay, Henry, what's so, what's so? No, he said, I never, I done never killed my mum. I never killed my mum. My my sister never killed my mum, but I done killed my sister. But I never, never killed anybody. Like he was completely off the wall. Um, <laughs> him and Otis O'Toole, they killed everything that walked, flew, swam. And I spent a good few weeks out in Texas. Uh, again, Cops, everybody, everything. Unique. I love Texas. And um, I didn't interview Otis, but I interviewed Henry. And um, he, the police say that he killed scores and scores of people. But in a lot of cases, what it was, was all these homicides. Well, the minute jurisdictions all around America realize Texas has got a complete nutball there. They want to they want to clear all their cold cases up, put it on Henry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think most of your viewers will go, yeah, he did 100 or 50 or 60. No way he didn't. But what he, I mean, some of the murders pinned on him were the same day, but 400 miles apart. <laughs> he couldn't have done them. <laughs> it got out of control, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> I mean, he was get. He had new teeth fit, fitted. Yeah. He had new clothes, and all these detectives are doing grip and grins with him. Yeah. And then he's in the limelight. <laughs> but you know, he got off death row because uh, he was mentally ill at the end, and uh, and but he died of natural causes. What about his sidekick? What happened to him? Otis, he died. Yeah, he was a sick man anyway. Was he? Yeah, they're both sickos. We but I think the only murder he actually got convicted of was the Orange Sox murder. Was it? And she was un unidentified anyway. Mm. The only, the, but but you see how it went from, <laughs> oh, just one identified girl. We got him, definitely got him for that. But let's have another 50 on top of that. We'll clear all our, ball, all our slates up. 